Welcome back to part two of the Telford ABC, and I do hope you've seen the first one. In this episode, we feature the letters N to Z, so I hope you enjoy the film. N is for the Newdale Tramway Bridge. This Grade 2 listed structure is to be found in Lawley, between the new development in Newdale and Overdale, and it's an important reminder of Telford's industrial past. Believed to be built in 1759 by the Colebrookdale Company, it was used to transport materials in horse-drawn wagons over a stream. It used to be difficult to see the sides of the bridge, but recently a low-level bridge and track has been constructed which allows one to get a much better view of this valuable relic of the area's early tramway network. O is for Observer Corps. Hidden away on a high point just off Bank Way in Ketley Bank is what remains of a Royal Observer Corps bunker. This was opened in 1961 and closed in 1991 after the threat of the Cold War disappeared. It was finally demolished and filled in by the council in 1992. Had the atomic bomb been dropped on the UK, ROC posts all over the country would be able to detect the direction and magnitude of the explosion, as well as the radiation levels, and report these back to a control centre, in this case one in Shrewsbury, which is now a veterinary surgery. This site had an Orlit A building too, and though rather buried, sections of the concrete wall slabs can be found acting as steps up to the site. There is some confusion as to where various things were sited, and there are other interesting areas on the mound. Two truncated wooden poles still exist, that may have supported power lines to the site, as well as a transformer, though ROC bunkers had their own generators. Not much remains, but it's an interesting place to remind one of the fear and the folly of the Cold War. P is for public art. Right from the outset, the Telford Development Corporation set out to give the town identity by commissioning some large and spectacular pieces of public art. Some, as reminders of lost heritage, such as the replica pit headgear on the Castlefields roundabout near Maidley. Others, like the spire at the entrance to Stafford Park, as a modern symbol of enterprise. Some works, such as Rock Strata Wall on the A442 by Bud Mosaics, representing the geology that was conducive to coal mining, are well known. But others take a little bit more seeking out. Many tell stories, such as the sculpture on the Forge Retail Park roundabout, which highlights items manufactured and for sale locally or the World War II guns on Garrison roundabout, celebrating the MOD activities in Donington. Since then, many new examples have been added, as well as others that have sadly fallen into disrepair. The most massive one you've probably never seen. Telford, spelt out in trees below the Telford Golf Club. Some may not be to everyone's taste, but there's no disputing that we're lucky to have such a broad collection of public art in the borough. Do look out for the many and varied examples of public art, and try to find out the stories behind them. There's more to them than meets the eye. Q is for Quaker Burial Ground. Tucked away in a quiet area behind the Derby houses in Colebrookdale and shaded by two large trees is the Quaker Burial Ground. Traditionally, Quakers, or the Society of Friends, shun all forms of ostentation. So this burial site, provided by Abraham Darby II, is without huge and ornate graves, instead having plain carved memorial stones that now line the walls, which are remarkably similar to that of James Fox, who founded the Quaker movement. 
William Reynolds is buried here. He was responsible for the Coalport potteries, building the canal tugboat system, construction of the tar tunnel, as well as encouraging technological innovation in steam locomotion. Francis Darby was the son of Abraham Darby III, who's famous for casting and building the Iron Bridge. He too, like his father, worked in the Colbrook Dale Company. Many members of influential Quaker families are buried here, including Abraham Darby II himself. This tiny piece of land, with views over Colbrook Dale, encompasses far more history than its diminutive size suggests. Free to view, it's well worth spending a few quiet moments pondering what it must have been like to be a Quaker and a member of one of these pioneering families. R is for Radburn Housing. With the need for the rapid development of housing and in a time of social experimentation, Radburn Housing was chosen for the new estates of Sutton Hill, Brookside and Woodside. Getting its name from Radburn, New Jersey, the design called for the separation of cars from those on foot. Typically, shared footpaths served the fronts of houses and cars were only able to get to the rear of properties or areas where garages were grouped together. This led to a warren of paths, causing residents to lose their way very easily. And it was not helped by beginning every street name with the same letter, something not recommended now. Sutton Hill has Southgate, Southfield, Smallwood, Sunnymead and Summer Hill, to name a few. Though, back in March 1967, the Queen did manage to find her way to Sandcroft to unveil a small plaque commemorating her visit. Without wanting to offend anyone living in one of these houses, the Radburn design has proved to be a wholly discredited architectural philosophy, which has led to increased crime and antisocial behaviour, not helped by the poor build quality of the housing, much of it now in very poor repair. The Shropshire Shell Guide of 1973 is scathing about these developments, describing Woodside as an utter abomination, and it goes on to say that it is difficult to imagine anything more depressing. This is not a townscape, it's pure tedium. Still, for as long as the houses remain standing, I think these are interesting places to visit, and many a happy family has been raised here. One wonders, however, how the original designers ever thought this was going to work. S is for subsidence. Telford's unique geology has led to a number of serious subsidence problems. The whole area is pockmarked with collapsing mines and those that live in the Ironbridge Gorge don't only have to contend with this and flooding but also the instability of the river's banks. Many will remember the timber road that led to the Half Moon Inn and moors a bit further down and the incredible roller coaster ride that used to go up and down as you drove along it. That's now gone as part of a multi-million pound stabilisation works done by Telford and Reakin Council to stop the riverbank sliding into the river, blocking the river and causing massive flooding upstream. Issues of subsidence can be clearly seen at the delightful Lloyd's Cottage, which leans precariously on its foundations as viewed from the road and has needed a lot of work to stabilise it. With Telford being the way it is, issues of subsidence are clearly not going to go away in the near or even distant future. T is for Thomas Telford's Mason's Mark. I wonder how many people have driven past this concrete roundabout decoration without giving it a second thought. Thomas Telford was born in Eskdale in 1757 and as a young man worked as a stonemason. Later he was to become County Surveyor of Shropshire and the rest is history. 
positioned on a roundabout on the A5, a road that he improved. It loosely represents his mason's mark, that of a saltair cross superimposed on two triangles joined by a vertical bar. The history of mason's marks is fascinating and today Telford's could be described as a great piece of graphic design. Perhaps you'll see it in a different light when you drive past it next time. U is for unconformity. The Rekin gets a mention under U for the unconformity here that's of international significance. It's quite a complex idea in geology, but what it means is when the layers were laid down in history, one layer is completely missing. That can be for one of two reasons. Firstly, as was the case here in the Rekin, that layer was completely eroded away. Or secondly, the layer was never laid down because that piece of land was above sea level at that time. Here, the Rekin quartzite beds can be seen to overlie, unconformably, the pinkish igneous rock of the late Precambrian period. You can also view ancient ripple lines, like the ones you see on a beach, showing that this location was once coastal. Do spend some time here imagining what it must have been like over 500 million years ago when these layers were deposited. A beach scene, very different from how Telford looks now. V is for vaults. Perhaps I'm using the word vaults rather loosely here, but these cast iron tombs are too good to miss. There are many great examples in the Telford area, including this rather sorry looking one at All Saints Church in Wellington, which rather unsurprisingly houses the Corbett family. At St Michael's Church in Maidley, designed by Thomas Telford and built in 1796, many other excellent examples can be found. The history of their inhabitants is fascinating, so here are a few examples worth exploring further. This iron top tomb predates Telford's church and houses John William Fletcher, one of the founders of Methodism, who worked and preached with John Wesley. Mary, his wife, Mary Tooth, her adopted daughter, and Sarah Lawrence, who continued his work, are also interred within this tomb. When you visit, note the different way the lettering on the tomb's upper surface is done for John. Look out also for William Baldwin's tomb, a local ironmaster with its large upright iron memorial slabs surrounded by a railed enclosure. The white paint that highlighted the text was clearly visible in the 1970s but has now disappeared. The graveyard also houses the rather unusually shaped iron memorial to Abigail Botley and others. On the way out, you can also not fail to see the impressive cast iron top of Edward Cranage's grave. W is for Watling Street. Watling Street gets its name from a tribe that inhabited St Albans and passes through Wellington on its way to Roxeter. It predates the Roman invasion and has played an important transport role ever since. After the Act of Union in 1800, Thomas Telford was given the job of providing a road for stage and mail coaches going to and from Ireland via Holyhead. Much of the route he chose was along the existing line that Watling Street took. It was to be a toll or turnpike road, with charging based on the distance one travelled. Turnpike roads therefore had milestones along their length and a number of these can still be found along the route of Watling Street as it passes through Wellington. One is located on Bennett's Bank and another on Hollyhead Road, as well as a third one on Hollyhead Road in Oakengates. Burkett Gate, or the Umbrella House, is a good example of a toll house, where a toll collector would have lived in some comfort. Thankfully, Tolls ended on this road in 1875. X is for level crossing. Granted a rather tenuous link to the letter X, but one that's too good to miss. Here at Gravel Lisos, just near Dosley, 
is the remainder of the rails that used to cross Holly Road. Until relatively recently, the rails just to the north of here were still in place and led to Horsehay. But to the south, they've all been lifted up to the point where they reach the line running to the former Ironbridge power station. I love these small little reminders of what the area used to be like when it was a bustling scene of industry. With talk of reopening this line, steam engines may well pass over this crossing again. But until then, the old track bed makes for a very pleasant stroll or ride. Why is for YMCA. It's quite possible that some people watching this film remember the YMCA in Wellington and have fond memories of time spent there in their youth. Back in the day, the building was a daily hub of activity for the youth of Wellington, offering to the youngsters attending what must have seemed a very impressive venue. Sporting a smoke-filled billiard room, table tennis and an ever-bustling canteen serving hot and cold refreshments, it became an extremely popular place for the youth of Wellington to hang out. Higher up the ornate staircase was a full ballroom with accompanying stage, which later hosted live bands. Membership was required, as was appropriate behaviour, though muscular Christianity was never on the agenda. The M in YMCA became a token letter when girls were finally admitted. Found at the corner of Walker Street and Tan Bank, the building is now looking a little sorry for itself. Do look up high, just below the roof lines, and you'll see simple crosses in the brickwork, a hint of the meaning of the sea in YMCA. Its use may have changed, but hopefully other symbols of its former successful role will be retained long into the future. Said is for Mount Zion Primitive Methodist Chapel. Primitive Methodists have been meeting in Maidley since the 1840s, and with a growing congregation, in 1865, the Mount Zion Chapel was built. With quite an early use of polychrome brickwork and a distinctive hood mould over the central doorway, it's a striking building. High up, an inscription with the name of the building and its opening date can be found on a concentric circle and a Rulu triangle. Tucked away to the right of the main doorway is a commemorative stone laid in August 1865 by Stephen Stokes. A symbol on a small side gate alludes to a previous use of the building by the Maidley print shop. Look closely too at the railings. These were made by Corbettson son of Wellington, who get a mention under D in the first video of this series. After just a hundred years of use, the chapel closed and was repurposed as the People's Centre. So I do hope you've enjoyed this film and the previous one that dealt with the letters A to M. As I've said before, it's been difficult to decide what to include and even more difficult to decide what to leave out. But anyway, I do hope it's given you a flavour of the fascinating history and the area that's Telford. We've been celebrating 50 years, so I won't be around in 50 years time to make another film unless I make it to 100. But until then, let's drink a toast to Telford. <laughs>